All right, good morning, everyone, on this beautiful day. Um, I'm a Monica Kumar. I'm one of the GYN oncologists here at Mayo. And I just want to thank you guys for joining us and giving us the opportunity to speak to you all about the things that we're passionate about. We, um, I will say, you know, I, we all um, here at Mayo, we're asked to give a lot of talks and we're asked to do a lot of um, presentations to people. And this really is just one of our favorite things to do, to be able to have a chance to talk to all of you and your loved ones about the things that matter to you and the things that matter to us. And um, just like Jamie had mentioned when we started, please just really think of this as a conference and a course directed for you. Ask all your questions. Don't hesitate. We're, we're going to have lots of time during the panel discussions, but also during the little breaks and lunch. Um, and uh, your feedback will be taken very seriously. So I'm going to talk a little bit um, about something that I care a lot about, um, and it's, uh, the title is Staying Fit, Not Frail During Your Cancer Journey. Um, and I, you know, just to, I'm going to talk a little bit about what frailty is. It sounds funny to say that we're going to define that, because I think everyone's like, well, I know what that is already, but we'll talk about what I mean when I talk about frailty. And then something that's kind of unique called sarcopenia. So I'll, I'll talk about what those are and why we care about them. And then we'll talk about uh, why they matter in cancer. So kind of generally in cancers as well as in um, ovarian cancer specifically. And I'll, I'll share some data that I have uh, looked at in our own institution. And then we'll talk about ways, most importantly, to mitigate those factors. So frailty, it's like, like you know, you kind of know, I, I know what frailty is, but when we think about it, we think of it as a clinical syndrome. So it's a set of characteristics we see in people, and it's characterized by a lack of reserve and sort of a vulnerability to stressors. And some of those stressors we think about are things that many of you have experienced. So having a big surgery or going through chemotherapy. And so I'll just kind of use... I'll show you with this pointer here. Does this work? I'm not sure how to use this, so I'll just explain it. So on the left side, that's kind of the fit person. And so you can see when they don't have any stressors, none of the red balls, they kind of are doing okay. But when you have the red balls, they have all these springs that will help them bounce back. So if they have a big surgery, they can bounce back really well. In the middle, you have someone who's kind of in the middle. They're a little bit frail, but they, you know, so they, they at baseline have a little bit less capacity. But when you put those stressors on, they bounce back, but they don't have quite as many springs, not quite as many, um, as big of ability to pop back. And so they get a little bit suppressed. And maybe that's represented with a little bit of functional decline or less independence or not feeling as well. And then on the um, far side is the frail patient. So that person already is kind of functionally less um, robust than the other two. But then when you put those stressors, those balls of stress, whether it be surgery, whether it be psychosocial distress, they don't have the ability to bounce back. And so that's what we're trying to define. Um, and this is a, a little bit of a busy slide, but there is this, the thing about frailty, we think of it as a syndrome. It's not just one thing. There's a lot of complex factors that go into this. And you'll see kind of on the top left, we think about age. So we do know frailty no matter what is age associated, but it's not completely correlative. So there are some young people who have frailty, and then there are some older people who are very robust without any frailty. Um, and so nutrition t plays a role, things like your immune status, the diseases you have, so relevant for this, ovarian cancer certainly can play a role in this frailty. And those can all go to cause decrease in nutrition in patients, patients because maybe they are not eating as well or because they're not absorbing as well or they're making things like ascites, you know, and so they're losing some of that good protein that they have. That can also lead to dysregulation in hormones, dysregulation in inflammation. You've probably heard us talk, we talk about inflammation when it comes to cancer. We talk about inflammation when it comes to surgery, but also things like heart disease and diabetes. All our organs can be affected by inflammation. And that can lead to 
anemia, so um, because of either the chronic disease, you know, you can just, you're chronically anemic, and so your red blood cells are low. Sarcopenia, which we're gonna talk a lot about in a minute, which is sort of inflammation and of your muscles, um, and can cause other deficits in other um, organ systems. And that can lead to, um, again, a decrease in your strength, a decrease in your vitality, your sort of metabolic rate, which is the sort of baseline, how our energy is spent in our body can all decrease. And when that happens, you get less energy, and then you're like less interested in eating, and you get less in interested in doing more activity, and then the cycle kind of continues to go around. And so we don't know where do people kind of get into this cycle, but when you get in, how, you know, I think one of the big questions we have is how do we identify people in this cycle and how do we break this cycle? So this is, um, this is patients actually not from Mayo. This is a large study with thousands and thousands of patients with patients with early cancers. And um, the big picture here is to look at how do people survive when they're frail versus non-frail. So the top line, I'll just describe, because we'll have a couple graphs like this, so I'll just kind of orient people to it. The bottom is time, so years from diagnosis. The, the uh, vertical axis, or the up and down axis, is the part of the percentage of people who are living. And this has, like I said, about 5,000 patients or so, so, and the top line are those patients who are really robust, so the non-frail patients, the, one, the kind of person we all want to be. And um, those patients had, you can see, is higher. They're more likely to live to that five-year mark than that bottom line where patients who are frail tend to not live as long. And we don't know why, right? We don't know what was their cause of death, but just looking at all causes, it's just um, their five-year survival was less. Now, there's lots of ways of measuring frailty. So, and we don't have a perfect system. That's one of the things we're looking at. So we can do things like, we sometimes have people get up and walk a certain distance. We ask people about their strength in their arms. We can ask about a whole bunch of subsets of questions about where do you live? How do you do doing alone? The way we've done it here, um, and this is because of our medical record, and this, we were able to abstract information kind of looking back at patients because of the Mayo medical record and all the information you guys have shared with us, looking at patients, and we, we asked a bunch of questions to patients about, like, how do you function at home? Do you need help getting ready in the morning? Do you need help making meals? Do you um, need help with transportation? So those things can indicate some degree of frailty. Those are on the left side. How do you do walking up flights of stairs? And the other things we look at is lots of diseases. So we think that if someone has multiple comorbidities, so a comorbidity, or not just your cancer, which is the main thing we're looking at, but the other things that influence your health, so things like diabetes, heart disease, um, uh, kidney disease, dementia, the more of those a patient has, the more frail they're going to have. So we are able to look at all of those and look at how frail an individual with an ovarian cancer is. So what we found is that when we split out patients, again, this is a similar picture that we looked at before, the patients who were frail did worse than the patients who were non-frail. So when we looked at from diagnosis to their years following surgery, how did they do? And these were patients only with advanced cancer. And the important message here is that there's a difference. And we don't really know what that difference is, but it's an important thing for us to say, to pay attention to and try to figure out what that difference is. So I'm gonna switch gears for just a second and talk about then sarcopenia. So sarcopenia is also related to frailty, but it's not the same thing. So again, frailty was this picture of a person and how they do functioning. Sarcopenia is actually looking specifically at muscle. And so this is a relatively new concept in medicine. And it's characterized by not having a lot of muscle. So if we actually can measure the amount of muscle someone has, having less muscle. And then it also has to do with having a loss of muscle function. So like being weaker, for example. 
And again, similar to the frailty, we think that both are age-related. So as you get older, this is something natural that happens, but there, it's also cancer-related. So we know patients with cancer will have this more than patients without cancer. So this is a picture. I'm going to just spend a couple of minutes describing how do we measure muscle on people. So you guys know how we measure. You know, you guys have probably all looked at your CT scans or had us go through CT scans with you and looked at tumors that we're measuring and evaluating. This is a different way of using CT scans. So on this picture, this is a CT scan of the abdomen. And we're kind of doing that bread loaf thing where you're, we're cutting you down in slices, and this is kind of right in the mil middle of your belly. And so what we're doing is we're looking at different areas of muscle and fat, and that helps us determine how much muscle someone has in their whole body. So the red part indicates the amount of muscle in the abdominal core, so like our core muscles. So up front on the very top, that's the front of our belly, that's those like six pack muscles that we all have. Um, and then the back is these back muscles. So you can see the bright white is the spine. So the muscles around the spine that keep us standing up. And then the muscles that kind of come across the belly. Okay, so that's the red part. That's us measuring muscle. The yellow is that fat that we all have inside our belly. So the part we never see, but inside near our organs. And then the blue is the fat that we have right under our skin and then also within the muscles. So it kind of infiltrates the muscles, which is a normal part of aging, okay? And so by looking at people's CT scans, we can get an evaluation of amount of muscle and muscle quality. So this is a meta-analysis. Um, so a meta-analysis is the type of study in which someone takes all the studies on a topic combines all that data and tries to look at what's the big conclusion. And so this was a cancer that looked at sarcopenia, so that measured this muscle in lots of patients with cancer, but lots of different types of cancer. So not just gynecologic cancers, but you know, lung cancers, breast cancers, um, kidney cancers, solid tumors. And it used about 30 studies, and it looked to see what was the effect. Now, if you go down the straight line in the middle, that would mean there would be no effect, that it didn't matter whether you were high or low in your muscle, that that would be equivalent. If you were more to the left of that graft, it would favor sarcopenia, meaning that that would be better. But you can see it, most of these lines are over to that red arrow. What that means on this graph is that patients who were not sarcopenic or had good functioning muscle tended to do better when they had cancers. Okay. There's also some toxicity. Dr. Jatoy just gave us a great talk looking at toxicities of treatment. And this is, again, toxicity in breast cancer, not ovarian cancer, but breast cancer patients use very similar chemotherapy to us. And on the left side, you can see that the patients in the big black bar were the percentage of patients who had a toxicity if they had low muscle. In that group of patients, about 50% of people will experience a toxicity. When you look at the people with normal muscle, we call it non-sarcopenic, but really normal muscle uh, amount and function, they were far less likely to experience toxicity. So it's not just about survival, but it's about how do people experience the drugs that they're getting. Um, and then same on the uh, far side. Again, the important part is that there's just two differences in those curves, that the patients who have good muscle versus not great muscle have different experiences with their treatments. And I think this is the last curve, maybe one more, I promise. But um, so this is what we looked like at ovarian cancer. Again, um, this is kind of split up into two different groups. So if you look at the red line, those are patients who had surgery and had disease left after surgery. And you can see how the red line, if you had the solid line, 
those patients had great muscle and those patients do far better than the patients with the dashed lines. And in fact, we talk a lot about having disease at, at the end of surgery. We work really hard, you guys go through a lot to try to get as much disease out of as possible. But it looks in these graphs that, that actually your muscle quality might matter even more than what we can get out at surgery. And so um, we, uh, so again, it is, this is just an early indication that the amount of muscle and the quality of muscle that people have probably affects their overall health and their cancer health. So um, when we looked at all these patients we talked about, we said, okay, who are the people who are sarcopenic? Who are the people who are frail? And who are the people who are both? And patients kind of grouped out. So the red dots indicate people who have both, who have a little bit of frailty, but they still have good muscle. The blue dots, which is the majority of our patients, are the people who actually are not frail and don't have any poor muscle. Those are the healthiest, most robust patients. And then there's a scattering of patients over on the, um, with the green that kind of have that sarcopenia and some frailty. And again, you can see on this graph, the main message here is that those patients in the green, the patients who are frail as well as have poor muscle, seem to have worse outcomes if we use our standard treatments. So with all of that, I hope I've convinced you that frailty and sarcopenia are worth us looking at, that these are important factors in patients, and we're just starting to look at that for our ovarian cancer patients, but I think the real question is what do we do about that? And so what can we intervene? How can you intervene to make that better? And I'll tell you, Two things, one is um, we don't completely know. I think like everything we're gonna talk about today, we have ongoing research to try to figure out how do we best affect this. But I will also say of everything we talk about, this will probably be the cheapest intervention you could ever imagine, and we'll talk about why. So the first is exercise, actually. And I put up this just the Nike just do it thing because there's been many trials, they're very small, but have looked at different groups of cancer patients. And honestly, when we look at all of the different exercise interventions, we can design very fancy ones with machines, we can design very simple ones. At the end of the day, what seems to matter is just doing something. So staying physically active as a person when you're in survivorship, when you're in treatment, will make a big difference. There seems to be something about resistance training, meaning if you can do some kind of weight, like light weights, I prefer bands. We have a whole exercise program that people can do at home using those resistance bands. They're cheap. You can do them sitting. So if you have a problem standing for long periods of time, there's sitting exercises you can do. Um, using the bands, low resistance, high repetition to gain some muscle. That seems to be a theme through different studies of helping people. And what I like about those resistance bands is it's not like equipment that you have to have in your house and clutter everything and gather dust. They're things that you can take with you, keep with you. There also seems to be some effort of cardiac training and all that means, if you remember very early, I talked about something called the VO2 and that, what that is is how much oxygen our bodies use and can consume and how, much, how high we can get our heart rate for a short period of time. Cardiac training in most of these studies is about walking. So people who can walk, bike, swim, whatever, you know, you don't need to be running a marathon. You know, Jamie mentioned Unleash the She and said, anyone who wants to run, I'll be walking it. So if anyone wants to walk it, you should join me. Um, just being, having something that gets your heart rate going. And then there's something called the obesity paradox. I'm just gonna mention it. I don't know that we totally understand its role in ovarian cancer, but we have seen it in other cancers. And what that means is that some, some people who are, we know we always talk about normal weight. You go to the doctor now and everyone wants your BMI between 18 to 24. It seems to be on the, if you're at the higher end of that or that 24 to 30 kind of range, there seems to be a benefit, probably something to do with reserve and something to do with our metabolic rate. 
The second is nutrition. So I would say every patient I see has a question about what can I do with as far as eating or changing my diet. Um, so the good news is, is we know that eating an adequate number of calories is helpful and that can help you through treatment. We, the bad news is, is that our nutrition science doesn't have a lot to say, this is what you should eat. I think we'd all hope that we could just have foods that if we do this, it's going to make us feel better or get through chemotherapy, or if I avoid this, that's the right thing to do. And, you know, it's frustrating. It's frustrating to me because I can't help people with that. It's frustrating for you all, I'm sure, because you just want to do the best for yourselves. But there might be some things about some vitamins. There might be some things about leucine, which is an amino acid. I think the most important right now that we can say for sure is getting adequate nutrition and getting some protein in a balanced diet and your nutrition. And then the other part of frailty is social interaction. So we know that if you were to really imagine in your head who's someone who's really frail that we know or what's a frail person, you know, there's a lot of social isolation that can happen with both chronic disease, the disabilities that chronic disease can add, or with getting older. And so we know that social interaction is really important. Um, in preventing frailty and helping fix frailty. And so, you know, we have a lot of things about where are we going. Um, the first is really understanding the biology. So I, I've talked a little bit about things that are relatively new concepts in cancer. And we're still trying to understand what is the, the relationship between cancer and this frailty and sarcopenia. You know, are, is it that frail, people who are frail or people who are sarcopenic are just getting cancer and it happens to coincide? Or is there something about the cancer that's causing that frailty or causing that poor muscle? What are some of the therapeutic interventions? We talked about diet and exercise, and we'd really like to start, start looking at diet and exercise interventions in patients. There are some pharmaceutical interventions. So there are inhibitors that our pharmaceutical companies have created that have shown benefit in non-cancer patients. Most of these have not been tested in cancer patients yet, and so that's really the next frontier for this field in the uh, area and the science of frailty and sarcopenia. And finally is how do we integrate this discussion, how do we in integrate these assessments into our practice so that we can make that part of how we determine treatments and help patients make decisions. And that's it. Um, So we're going to actually reserve questions for our breakout session or during this break right now. I, I, you'll have a break until about 1030. Um, and so feel free to get some coffee, get some breakfast. I think that Luca might be joining us now, hopefully this morning. Um, so, and Luca is amazing. And we'll go from there. Thanks, guys.